Hi ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Aniset of recording of ophthalmology and uh, again guiding through your friendly neighborhood ophthalmologist here and we start this is a rapid recap of Aniset. So what we're going to do through is going to rapidly going through some images and you know nowadays a lot of questions are image based particularly ophthalmology we have a lot of questions based on images. So we are going to go rapidly and give you some clues as to what may be asked may not be asked. Okay? So it's going to be fast, short and sweet. So hold on to your seats, do not panic, because it's going to be short and fast, okay, very well. And again, to start with, we are going to begin with my favorite eyes, the Mona Lisa, sketched 500 years back by Leonardo. Very well. So here we go, and ladies and gentlemen, this is the first question before you, and take a look at that. What do you see in front here is a circle there, is it not? And what I want to ask you is the procedure and look at this bluish thing that is there. I mean, this is a question we've asked repeatedly in the last few years nowadays of every possible exam, not only of finance set but of neat PG, sometimes in FMG exams also. So you have to tell me what this procedure is, the circle thing and this bluish thing, the dye that has been used to stain. And that is the question. And the answer here, ladies and gentlemen, as most of you will have hopefully have got this, is the procedure is capsular excess, okay? What is that? Capsule exercise means tearing the capsule in a single motion, a single circular motion. So the full term is sometimes called as CCC, circular continuous capsule excess. Okay, so continuous circular capsule excess where we tear it off in a single motion and preparatory to take out the cataract and insert dial. As you see, we have to take out the cataract from this opening and implant dial here also, is not so that it forms in the perfect capsular bag and this blue dye that you see ladies and gentlemen that is the next question this we do the name of the dye which you like to ask you is called trippin blue okay you have to remember this name it's been increasingly be asked of late trippin blue and this we do remember when we have cataracts when we have mature cataracts when there's no retro image there's no glow against which you can see the capsule is not in this case you can see it is a hard cataract and you do not see the glow here so against, if you see a normal retinal emission glow, then you can see the capsule, we can tear it off easily. But here there's no glow. And that is why we had to stain the capsule with triple blue to make it visible for us. Otherwise, we would not be able to tear it off. Okay, so this is capsule excess being performed by triple blue in a mature or a hard cataract where the retinal emission glow is blocked very well. I hope many of you got it. And here is a more difficult question. Look at these vessels, ladies and gentlemen. Look at this conjunctival vessels. They are like this. You know, we call this typical corkscrewing of conjunctival vessels like a corkscrew okay so let me write down this word for you and this is called cork screwing of conjunctival vessels where they become irregular like this okay and the question is where would you see them remember this typical engorged vessels this engorged vessel is so obvious now remember you can see that the conjunctiva is red this is not the normal color of the conjunctiva, conjunctiva is transparent is it not so this reddening of the conjunctival is because of the engorged vessels and typically this corkscrewing is seen and that is a question ladies and gentlemen in a carotid cavernous fistula ccf okay whenever there is a connection between high arterial blood flow like carotid artery and a low blood flow as in the carotid cavernous fistula and the cavernous sinus so this blood flow this connection this abnormal connection between high and low blood vessels it gives rise to the engorged finding of conjunctiva with the corkscrewing of blood vessels i mentioned this is ccf very typical so you will typically have a patient older patient who has a spontaneous ccf and this is the anti-segment finding that we look for now your next thing is what is this investigation that you are seeing here another very popular question remember this is the hurtles exophthalmometer please take a look at this because this is a very popular question of late hurtles exophthalmometer is not thalmometer pardon my handwriting is terrible and what is that is maintains it how it measures quantifies if you have exophthalmos or proptosis so what you do is you place the instrument against a lateral rim okay you can see the two rims are placed and what it measures is that in millimeters measures the distance between the lateral orbital rim and the corneal apex okay so from the lateral orbital rim to corneal apex so you place the instrument something here and there's a system of mirrors here which you cannot see here i mean this angled arms 
system of mirrors here and you see the reflection of the corneal apex on the mirror and it measures distance between the lateral orbital rim and the corneal apex and remember that it should not be more than 21 millimeters okay most of us we have within 20 millimeters but we give them one minute extra if it's more than 21 millimeters, that is the distance between the lateral orbital limb and the corneal apex is more than 21 millimeter we classify as proptosis okay cross proptosis and if you have difference of more than two millimeters in between the two eyes okay if you have ideally it should be the same is it not because both are the same level but if there's a difference of more than two millimeters between the two eyes that also is abnormal or if it's absolute more than 21 millimeters in Hertel's exophthalmometer, it means that you have proptosis or exophthalmos. Okay, so that's a very important question. You have to identify the instrument called the Hertel's exophthalmometer. The next thing is another important sign. Look at this optic disc, and can you see these two zones here close to the optic disc? You can see which you have marked in white here. See, this is one zone, this is another zone. They have to name these zones. Okay, remember. So, because these zones are around the optic disc, we call this the PPA, okay, PPA, which stands for peripapillary atrophy, you know, papilla means optic disc. So, PPA means peripapillary atrophy. So, these are zones around the disc. Remember, the outer zone is called the alpha zone, the inner zone is called the beta zone, okay. So, this is an important examination technique, particularly when suspecting glaucoma, where you have peripapillary atrophy. Remember, alpha zone is the outer zone. You remember that. As you come in from there, alpha zone. The beta zone is the inner zone, which is this one. And in glaucoma, the beta zone is important because you have damage to the beta zone. The alpha zone, you have some pigmentation, sometimes hypo, hyperpigmentation. It is normal. It can be seen in normal. This represents the retinal pigment epithelium and it can be seen in normal cases also. Alpha zones can be seen. But beta zone pigmentation, hyper or hypo is abnormal and the sign of glaucoma, okay. So, that is what, please kindly remember, the alpha zones and the beta zones. Remember, alpha is out, beta is the inner zone, okay. And then we have this where you have the arrows. Hey, look at this disc. First of all, you will see this disc lesion that is blurring of disc margins, you know, which means that hey, there is a disc edema here, blurring of disc margins. But what we are not asking, again, not about the disc edema per se, but we are asking here, are these folds which you can see if you look very carefully which are accentuated by the arrows here what are these folds these radial folds that are radiating out from the disc edema here and the name for this fold here remember these are called as patterns lines okay remember patterns lines patterns lines are seen in papilledema okay papilledema whenever disc edema remember disc edema due to raised ict is called papilledema so, the disc edema is so much more in papilledema that it creates these radial folds, circumferential folds sometimes, sometimes radial folds around the retina surrounding it and this is called pattern line. This is a sign of papilledema. Remember, you do not see this optic neuritis because the volume of edema and papilledema is so much more that it raises folds in the surrounding retina. Okay. So that is why, remember, the presence of patterns lines tells you it's papilledema. You cannot have patterns lines in optic neuritis simply because the, the swollen optic disc does not have so much volume to produce these patterns lines. Okay. Another thing, other things that helps us in diagnosing papilledema rather than optic neuritis, you know, is that is a bilateral most of the times. Except rare cases, you can have unilateral papilledema, as in Foster Candy syndrome. Also remember that in papilledema, you will often have a lot of other findings like exudates will have hemorrhages all around the disc, which are not seen usually in optic neuritis, okay. So, patterns lines is the question and that is the answer that you've got very well. Then a simple enough question, you look at this printout that you have, often you get these kind of printouts and they ask you, what is this printout for, what is measuring and remember the printouts are measuring, this is the visual field printout, we call VFA sometimes, the Humphreys visual field analysis. Whenever you're suspecting glaucoma or more rarely you have neuroophthalmic problems, then you do the visual field analysis on a Humphreys perimeter, which is the gold standard perimeter. And this is how the printout looks like with a gray scale, with a pattern chart, with a total chart. And this is how it should be able to identify. You may not be asked to, to find out the findings, the abnormal findings in this glaucoma, but you might very well be asked to identify what this printout looks like. Kindly remember, this is a visual field analysis chart for glaucoma. Very well. 
Next is an important new investigation here and the look of it looks familiar to you, doesn't it? But you'd be quite wrong. This is not a fluorescent angiogram. It's not a fluorescent angiography. So then what is it? It is actually a combination of an OCT and an angiogram. This is called a OCTA. It's called an OCTA. It stands for Optical Coherence Tomography Angiogram. Okay, so this is a combination of OCTA. This is the latest investigation. Remember, this is very useful because it tells us the vascular pathology without injecting any intravascular dyes. You know, remember in FA and ICG, we have to inject these dyes. These dyes are invasive and sometimes they cause a major allergic reaction. It could even lead to bronchial asthma. It could lead sometimes to convulsions. It may lead to even more serious anaphylactic shocks. So we would like to avoid these injections in older patients. So OCTA is a non-invasive way of visualizing the vascular network of the blood vessels in the retina. The principle is based on reflectance of laser light. What we do, we beam a laser light and it reflects off the surface of the moving red blood cells. And this gives us an idea of the microvascular of the retina without injecting a single dye. So this is called OCTA, which stands for Optical Coherence Tomography Angiography. Okay, so this is the typical OCT. I have recognized, learn them. These are new investigations we have to now memorize and look up because ophthalmology is full of investigations. Another investigation I'd like to ask you: What is the instrument that you see, and what is it called, and what is it used for? And there's a clue here. You can see the inset picture. Remember, most of you hopefully have got the right. Remember, this is called the Pentacam. Okay, this is called the Pentacam. And it is used to visualize the anti-segment primarily, the cornea, because it has got the rotating Schimfla camera, which photographs not only the anti-surface of the cornea, but the posterior surface also, and gives us a huge three-dimensional picture of the anti-segment of the eye, right from the cornea to the iris to the lens. Up till the lens only, remember, this is a pentacam, and it is used as a corneal topography instrument of great value for picking up keratoconus patients, for eliminating patients who are not suitable for refractive surgery. So this is the pentacam, which looks like this, you know, with a wide surface area. And you've got a hint here with the blue and grace. You can see the greens and the blues here, the printouts that we represent the pentacam findings. So this is the pentacam. The next thing is easier for you most, well, ladies and gentlemen, you have to find, tell me what this finding is, this pupil is called, and see what is this problem here okay so you see this is the problem here is iridodialysis you know, this is called iridodialysis and which means separation of the iris from its root which is the ciliary body and look at the pupil this pupil is not the typical circular pupil that we all of us have this is the d-shaped pupil is not this is called the d-shaped pupil and is found in this condition called as iridodialysis okay which is the because of blunt trauma, you have a separation of the iris from its root. This is called iridase, which you can see here, and leading to a D-shaped pupil. Always a very powerful MCQ. D-shaped pupils are seen in iridodialysis. Very well. Then another important and a very often asked question is what is investigation being performed? And hopefully most of you have got this. All of you should have got this. This is the Goldman Applination Tonometer, the gold standard for tonometry, the best and the most accurate tonometer for measuring intraocular pressure is called the Goldman, named after the ophthalmologist, the Swiss ophthalmologist who devised his applanation. Applanation is the principle because it applanates the surface of the cornea tonometry. Okay, you should all get this with the blue light and the typical touching of the cornea. This is the GAT, the best instrument for recording, the most accurate instrument for recording intraocular pressure. Very well. That almost all of you have got this, I hope. And this is another standard question popularly asked. What is the instrument that you see here? This and seeing by, remember, lo a lot of instruments, look, these are obviously forceps or clamps like that. But you can see that the ring here gives you the clue. The superior part is a ring, but the inferior part is not a ring, it's flat. And this is called as, this ring tells us that this is a Calaison forceps. Okay. It's a calaison forceps, and you know what a calaison is. A calaison is a inflammatory granuloma of the bewoman glands, is not. It's a granuloma. So it's not painful, chronic inflammatory granuloma of the bewoman glands, which is has to be either first, if it's earlier stage, we can treat by giving 
hot compresses, but the later stage becomes difficult to melt. So we have to do incision and curettage. So this is what you put inside. The ring gives it away because you divert the eyelid, place the ring over the chalazion and incise it and curate it out. Remember, we take it out, curettage. It's not instant drainage. You do IND for pus, for anything that is an inflammatory and contains pus. But this is not pus. We have to do incision and curettage. This is the chalazion forceps and hopefully all of you have got this. Right, very well. The next thing is to look at this picture and see the intraocular lens here and identify what kind of intraocular lens. Now remember, this is not a normal monofocal IOL because you can see the rings. You can see the concentric rings on the surface of the IOL. This is the specialized multifocal IOL. Okay, this is called the multifocal intraocular lens. What is that? For remember, the most popular IOL is the monofocal IOL, is it not? This is called a monofocal IOL and what it does, it focuses rays of light for distance. For near, you have to wear glasses after cataract surgery. A lot of patients do like this, you know, they do not wear to want to wear reading glass even after cataract surgery. So, this is a multifocal IOL where you have both distance and near focus given by these grooves on the surface identified by these grooves. Okay, this works in the principle of simultaneous vision where both stimuli, both clear vision as well as hazy vision is presented to the retina and this may reduce the contrast of the picture being visible to the patient. It may reduce and that may cause problems for the patient but a lot of patients would rather have the convenience of not wearing near glasses and sacrifice the contrast. Okay, So these are called multifocal ads remember you can recognize them by the grooves on the surface right? and indicate for patients who do not want to wear glasses after cataract surgery. Very well. Now, what you see, and again, you see this should not be too difficult. Remember, we have this bilateral disc edema. You can see there are bilateral disc edema here by the hazy margins, and you can see the hemorrhages here and the flame hemorrhages here. So, this is not optic rhitis, as I just mentioned, this is papillary edema, where you can see bilaterality, plus you see the hemorrhages and the exudates, which are not usually found in any other findings of optic disc edema except for papillary edema. This is papilledema, which means disc edema with raised intracranial tension. Very well. The next thing, what are these for? Look at these findings. You can see these rounded things on the limbers. And you have to tell me these findings. And hopefully all of you got this correct. Yes, these are the cicatrized follicles of trachoma. Herbert spits, we call them the famous Herbert spits, which tells us of a past attack of trachoma. Because they sequestrate follicles, remember the sevogren follicles of trachoma. So you just ask the patient to look down, hold up the lids like this, and look down, and on the upper limbers, you will find the telltale sequestrated follicles called Herbert Spitz, found nowhere else except in trachoma. Very well. That was an easy one, that was, let me tell you, and don't tell me otherwise. What about this? And look at this wonderful finding. Look at this classic parallel railway tracks, horizontal railway tracks right across the cornea. And I hope all of you got this correct because these are the famous habstri. They call the habstri. Stri means folds member, and habstri are seen in both thalamus, primary congenital glaucoma, because of the stretching of the eyeball because of raised intraocular pressure, which pulls the desmets membrane apart and tears it. These ruptures of the desmets membrane, so beautifully photographed, are the famous habstri. Remember the other stri in ophthalmology are the Vogue's tri which are found in keratoconus. Very well, I knew you would all get this. Very well. What's next now? That is a little more difficult, ladies and gentlemen. Let's take a look at that. What is it? See this weird white line on the cornea that you see? These whitish half little looking lines. What are these? Remember, this is a characteristic sign of this particular finding. This is what you see is acanthamoeba keratitis. Acanthamoeba keratitis. And please remember, these are the findings that you see. This is called as Radial keratoneuritis. Okay, please remember these are called as radial keratoneuritis. Radial kerato because cornea neuritis findings very typically seen in acanthamoeba, also seen sometimes in pseudomonas. Remember, but classically described acanthamoeba keratitis, and this is infiltration of the corneal nerves. That is what makes the acanthamoeba so painful. This typical whitish streaks that you see is the infiltration of the corneal nerves by the acanthamoeba. Very powerful sign because radial keratoneuritis. The reason why acanthamoeba is so painful because infiltration 
of the corn nerves. Now, kindly remember that there is in even in pseudomonas, sometimes you can get it, but you have to remember acanthomocaritis and the real keratinitis. Very good. That was a difficult one that was, but if you've got it, you're doing great. Another simple one, look at this brownish ring on the corneal legendment. You have to identify this and I hope all of this got this correct. Yes, this is the famous Kaiser Fleischer ring, the cave ring of Wilson's disease where you deposit deposition of copper on the desmus membrane in Wilson's disease. Often asked by a neurologist to confirm, a neurologist, you know, they are not very sure that Wilson's disease they often asked to confirm them by asking us to take a look at the patient on the slit lamp and you see the copper deposition. It could be greenish also, it could be brownish also, you can see the brown hair. The copper deposition on this membrane called the KF ring of Wilson's disease. The other famous ocular finding you all remember of Wilson's disease is the sunflower cataract. The sunflower cataract and KF rings are the two important ocular findings of Wilson's disease. Very well. I hope most of you got this correct. That's the easy one. Look at these parallel longitudinal, these coiled snake-like glands on the upper tarsal conjunctiva. You have to identify these glands and these are, you've all got it correct, I hope. These are the amoebomin glands. This is not the amoebomin glands which secrete this oily layer called amoebum and which form the outermost layer of the tear film, the task of which is to prevent evaporation. It's so hot outside in our country that if you went outside, their tears would evaporate in a matter of minutes. But so what the moment gland does, okay, these are modified sebaceous glands. What they do is to secrete an oily layer called the amoebum, which coats the tear film on the outer surface and prevents evaporation. And this is the, exactly I was, we were talking about this in a few minutes back and talked about glazion, which is a chronic inflammatory granuloma of the moment glands, is not? So this is the moment glands, which you should identify if given to you. The next thing, ah, it's an important finding. Look at that, this typical diffuse reddish area over the conjunctiva and the sclera. Can you tell me, is it conjunctivitis? Incorrect. Is it uveitis? Incorrect. This is scleritis. This is diffuse scleritis. How do you know that? Remember, look carefully, look at the color. The color of this particular patch of diffuse redness is not a bright red, which is seen in conjunctivitis, okay? It is not even a salmon pink red, you know, pinkish red, which is seen in uveitis, and uveitis. This is very definitely a bluish red in color, a violaceous red, you know. It is a slightly bluish because this is the deepest layer of the blood vessels, the deep scleral blood vessels inflame, the deep scleral vessels got inflamed. Remember the three vessels we have, you know. We have the conjunctival plexus, which gets inflamed conjunctivitis, the bright red, which has no particular pattern. And the second one is the episcleral vessels which get inflamed in antiuveitis, okay? And the third is the deepest layer is the scleral, deep scleral vessel which inflamed scleritis. And you get to know the difference by the typical violaceous or a violet blue color redness, which is typically seen not so well by a slit lamp, but by direct sunlight. You see it on direct sunlight, you see this violaceous color, which tells you the deepest layer of the vessels have inflamed. This is scleritis, a big, problem for us, for older women, 60 year old patients who wake up at night with this pain, particularly with movement of the eyeballs. This is the diffuse scleritis inflammation that we're looking at. Next thing, major, another important find, look at that, look at, along the blood vessels, you see this weird whitish area. What do these things are? These are, let me tell you, this is exactly what they look like. These are the famous candle wax drippings in sarcoidosis. Remember, this is, they look exactly like candle wax drips when the candle melts away, this is what it forms and they're found in, you know, acute sarcoidosis, acute phase of socular sarcoidosis and the, what is the significance of this, this apart from diagnosis that it usually means there will be more recurrence of sarcoidosis when you get these findings, usually they are recurrent sarcoidosis and the prognosis is, becomes a little more worse, it's poor, poor prognosis, long term prognosis for sarcoidosis is poor if you detect these candle wax drippings. So, can you remember very famous findings for ocular sarcoidosis, candle wax drippings, okay, in ocular sarcoidosis. Very well. So, we are all doing well, I hope. Many of you are doing fine. And again, a very standard question. Look at this peculiar ring that you see on the anti-lens capsule, that peculiar ring-like thing here. You see this ring here, no? This ring is deposited in the lens anticapsule and what is this diagnostic of? Remember, 
you got it right this is the target sign sometimes called the bullseye sign of pseudo exfoliation okay pseudo exfoliation where you this fibrillus you see this fibrillar kind of material this flaky uh, dandruff like material which you see deposited on the anti surface of the lens like this there are actually three rings there's one which you see here and there's one which you may not be able to see unless i sketch it out look at that this is the second ring here okay just beneath the pupillary margin so we have one ring here of the flaky fibular material deposit on the lens capsule and the second ring just covered by the pupillary margin and there's a clear gap between them there's a lucid interval and this is the famous we also call the hoar frost ring okay not that you need to memorize this this is not uh, they have never been asked the name of the ring has never been asked to my knowledge and should never be because this is one of those trivia questions which i love to ask but not a good idea to ask for students pseudox for your question is to remember this is the pseudox fluorescence diagnosis and this is the flaky material deposit on the lens capsule it can be seen on the pupillary margin also and this tells us diagnosis also called the target sign sometimes called the bullseye sign sometimes called the hoar frost ring but all point to one pill diagnosis pseudo exfoliation syndrome okay very well next question ladies and gentlemen is this dark thing which is looks quite ominous and what is that you can barely see anything is it not well this is total hyphema but there's a slight the entire anti chamber is full of blood remember but it is not called total hyphema it is called a black ball hyphema okay when the entire anti chamber is full of blood we often call it as black ball hyphema also called as eight ball hyphema okay it's also called as eight ball hyphema what is the difference between this and total hyphema you have to remember that they are not the same actually okay eight ball hyphema black ball hyphema see black total hyphema is when fresh blood bright red blood is seen in the anti chamber filling up the entire chamber but when it's a dark black like this or bluish black like this, this is called black ball hyphema or eight ball hyphema difference is that this means that there is no circulation of aqueous and there is poor oxygenation there is poor oxygenation of the aqueous and very little circulation of the aqueous this is ominous because it has a higher chance of developing angle closure or pupillary block glaucoma so total hyphema the chance of glaucoma are less but if you get a eight ball hyphema or a black ball hyphema then the chances of developing angle closure glaucoma are higher that is the significance of the black ball hyphema and the next thing is what is this finding that you see here first we have to look at this weird thing and focus on this red streak that you can see here can you tell me what this 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 find can you remember you have to recognize this kind of a finding when given the exam this is a gonioscopic find this is how gonioscopy looks like okay the angle and this blood this redness that you see here is neovascularization of the angle you can call it nva it stands for neovascular of the angle which is seen on gonioscopy remember you have to pick up this gonioscopic pictures when they show it to you in the exam but it looks like this with the wedge of the iris and which is attaching to the ciliary body and at the angle you can see nva which means there's an advanced stage of neovascular glaucoma as the angle gets zipped up by blood vessels so the angles close so there is no aqueous circulation out of the eye and the intraocular pressure rises this is a secondary angle closure glaucoma which you call as neovascular glaucoma which is diagnosed by gonioscopy very well so we're doing fine so far there's the next question what about this and this if you look at this what is the exact fine remember here what you see is the entire optic disc has been swallowed up by the cup so this is the famous goa which stands for glaucomatous optic atrophy not that island paradise okay which you are dreaming of not that goa this stands for glaucomatous optic atrophy where the optic disc now is full the entire nrr has been the destroyed the scoptic ratio is 1 because the area of the cup is equal to the area of the disc the entire rim of nr has been destroyed and this is glaucoma optic atrophy here you can see the peripapillary atrophy again you can see the alpha zone and the beta zone here and i told you remember that the beta zone gets prominent and it has findings in the atrophy of the beta zone in glaucoma so here you see the peripapillary atrophy also but the optic disc is completely swallowed up 
by the cup. This is glaucomatous optic atrophy, the CDR ratio of 1. This is total glaucomatous cupping. Okay, absolute glaucoma. There's nothing we can do for this patient. And then again, we have a disc sign here that's most important. Take a look at that. If you look at the disc, as you can see, the disc, this looks there are two important things here. First of all, take a look at the edges. Edges are blur, so there's disc edema. Is it not? There's not a clear cut disc margin. As a blur, so there is a disc edema. But what is surprising, if you look at the look at the color of the optic disc, it's a pale disc edema. Remember, whenever normal, how, how do I know it's pale disc edema? Well, edema because of the blurring of disc margins, and pale, you can see the pallor here. Remember, whenever you have disc edema, most of the times, almost all the times, it is hyperemic. So there'll be engorgement. The surface is actually reddish. You know the color of the optic disc, healthy NRR is a reddish orange color. So when you have disc edema, it becomes even more reddish because of the number of vessels increase. So we call mostly this engorged or it can be called as a hyperemic disc when you have disc edema. But there is one disc edema which is not hyperemic but is pale. We identify this condition by that famous pale disc edema and that is called as giant cell arthritis. Please remember this is AION. This condition is AION which is caused by giant cell arthritis. Please remember AAION we call it giant cell arthritis causing anterior ischemia of neuropathy. This is diagnosed by the famous pale disc edema only one of the few conditions in fact probably the one condition that you should know which is pale disc edema. Giant cell arthritis is fearsome and it may lead to bilateral blindness because it usually attacks the other eye within a few weeks. So can you remember pale disc edema significant for giant cell arthritis causing AION. Very well. Let's go next question. And again, in comparison, see, this is not a question. I just is just in comparison to the disc edema I wanted to show you. You can make out. Look at this disc edema again. How do I know? Because of the blurring of disc margin. So disc margin is blurred here, but look at the blood vessels here. The blood vessels are here engorged. So this is papillary edema. Okay. Again, disc edema. I told you that you get all these findings of soft X-rays, hard X-rays, hemorrhages, uh, papillary edema. And you look at the color, this is hyperemic, but look at the color of disc edema, this is pale. This is giant cell arthritis and this is papillary edema. Most of the edemas are not pale disc edema, they are hyperemic. Very well. The next question is here. Now look at this lovely finding. What is this finding? You can look at this peculiar radiating kind of a thing here. You have the disc here. Again, if you look carefully, you see the disc is edematous because there is blurring of disc margin. But what about the radiating stuff here looking like of almost like fireworks in Diwali. This is condition which you call as macular star. Please remember this is a condition because we call it a macular star because it looks like that. There's nothing to explain the star like things and this is the macular star when you see it has a lot of different diagnosis. But remember the first different diagnosis that you have to have when you see a macular star you should be neuroretinitis. Okay, This is a condition which is called the neuro retinitis where both the optic disc and the surrounding macula is inflamed. Inflammation of both the disc, the, remember the disc inflammation is primary and the macular inflammation is secondary. So it is the edema, disc edema that has spilled over from the optic disc and gone deposited all around the macula and it is that the, what you see this radiating fibers are the extras. The, the lipid deposits from the edema has come out and deposited all around like a macular star. Okay, so remember both the disc and the macular flame. This new retinitis. This should be first different diagnosis. But remember, your question is macular star. That is the finding. You have to recognize this macular star. Is there any other possibility that macular stars can be seen in other conditions? Yes. Apart from new retinitis, you can have in hepatitis retinopathy also. You can have in hepatitis retinopathy also. You can have in papillodema also. You can have it in diabetic papillopathy also. Okay, so these are some other four different conditions you should remember for macular star but the number one is neuroretinitis and in when you think of neuroretinitis number one cause neuroretinitis should be cat scratch disease caused by Bartonella when you have a domestic pet as a cat in the house it can have a cat scratch disease is the number one infectious cause of neuroretinitis so macular star again differential will be neuroretinitis hypertensive retinopathy papillodema diabetic papillopathy okay very well that's a lovely finding and now you know all about it as much as I do. This look is another beautiful. This look is refractile, the shiny, refractile, orangish, yellowish color. Uh, what is this? And this many of you have seen, particularly when we talk about CRAO. This is the famous Hollenhorst 
plug remember this name can be asked to you remember because after all you are appearing for the ion set which is institutes of national importance so hollenhorst h o l l e n h o r s t for those who cannot read my spidery handwriting plaque named after american ophthalmologist remember this is seen at what is the this is basically a cholesterol plaque okay this is a cholesterol plaque and it is seen at the bifurcation of the artery you can see the bifurcation it gets trapped here in the bifurcation of the arteries this is a sign of this clot a cholesterol emboli has broken off from the carotid arteries or the aortic arch atherosclerosis so it is broken off either from a carotid atherosclerosis or a aortic arch atherosclerosis and it's got trapped at the bifurcation of the retinal arteries here one of the most common cause of central retinal arterial occlusion however the finding you can recognize by the yellowish orange color like refractile and very shiny this is the hollenhorst plaque which is a cholesterol emboli broken off from the carotid arteries very well so we are all doing fine now a lot of interesting and important findings any of which can be asked in your exams and now ladies and gentlemen take a look at this look at this swelling here which you see here this is the swelling which you see here if you look carefully look at the cystic balloon like swelling right over the macula and the hint here is these are young men anything between 20 to 50 years of age having a lot of stress in their lives you know which could be the stress looking at this video of mine you know jabbering away continuously that is also part of the stress so what do you get a young man the hint look at let's give the clinical clue you have usually a 20 to 50 year old a guy who is often very stressed out is a operator word is stress here okay who has the sudden painless loss of vision along with metamorphosis distortion of shape and that you got your clue this is indeed csr central serous retinopathy you got central serous retinopathy here where you see this kind of a bullous kind of a fluid right over the macula and this is a fluid which is deposited over the macula in between the neurosensory and the rp over the macula that's correct this is the macula here and but the plane is the retinal pigment epithelium and the neurosensory layer this is the fluid plane of the fluid here this is central serous retinopathy occurring to young males often a lot of stress often have a history of steroid intake and sudden pain and loss of vision which recovers within 3 months as the fluid gets absorbed so please remember this halo light reflex that you see a typical haloish you get this ring like thing halo ring kind of a thing on the macula so clear cut so diagnostic of csr very well and what about these yellowish whitish deposits on the macula here this is yellowish white deposits on the macula these are drusen okay these are drusen a german word for potato stones you know potato stones they we have and these are again deposits over the macula this is a finding of armd age related macular degeneration okay drusen are the most common findings of dry and remember armd has two findings 90% cases are dry armd which is relatively benign but 10% of cases are wet armd or exudative armd which have the characteristic sign of cnvms choroidal neovascular membranes here you have drusen as the most common finding of dry armd so these are deposits all on the macula but remember they are not actually in the retina the level is on the choroid they are actually on the brooks membrane okay so the deposit that's why we call them choroidal neovascular membranes in wet armd also called srnvms okay so this is the drusen the famous drusen which is the hallmark of dry armd for age related macular degeneration for people who are above mostly very old people the definition encompasses anybody above 50 but they are mostly very old in 70 80 years of age typically they are white you know the most important modifier risk factor here is smoking chronic smokers have that so from armd now we go another lesion of the macula and here you see this clear cut hole over the macula and this is exactly what it says what is the finding is the macular hole this is a full thickness macular hole which you see often the most common cause idiopathic we do not know the cause found in older women most of the time post menopausal women but it could be trauma could be seen myopics could be seen after chronic cystoid macular edema macular hole where there is a slow painless loss of vision along with metamorphopsia which means distortion of shapes remember the famous question that we like to ask in macular hole is the famous what's k allen sign okay this is the mcq which you often ask about the macular hole 
called the watts kalman sign where what happens when you take you take you place a slit lamp and you direct a beam of light onto the retina okay as the beam moves across the retina patient can see but as it moves across the retina and into the macular hole you will the patient will suddenly report a thinning of the beam okay so the beam which was so wide here as it passes on the center it will appear to the patient to be thinned out like this okay in this area he'll report a thinning of the light beam as it passes the macular hole this is the famous watts kalman sign which we see in macular holes remember again idiopathic older women postmenopausal 67 plus they but they could have myopics they could have in post trauma or chronic cystoid macular edema very well so watts kalman sign macular holes kindly watch out for this mcq and then this which is what is beautiful brightly you no know, colored like a christmas tree and there you have the clue here it is nothing but the christmas tree cataract okay christmas tree a christmas still far away but the christmas tree cataract is here and christmas tree cataract which is shining refractile elements which just like a christmas tree hung out with lights and found in myotonic dystrophy myotonic dystrophy these are patients often you all remember the frontal baldness with a hatchet like face okay and myotonic dystrophy classically diagnosed when you're shaking your hands the muscle isn't to goes into spasm so is not able to release your hand while shaking hands okay if that is if you shake hands with your patients which i often do so myotonic dystrophy here but maybe should not shake hands now in the times of covid so therefore this is the christmas tree cataract of myotonic dystrophy very well there another lovely finding look at this beautiful triangular area on the cornea hair what is that and what condition do you see it see if you identify this look at the clear cut shape like a triangle does it not look let me give a hint itching young boys in the hot summer weather constantly itching their eyes irritating itching morning misery morning call morning misery not because they have to wake up in the morning and attend dr ray's lectures but the severe photophobia blepharospasm and the itching that you know besets them as soon as they open their eyes morning misery this very well you've got them all this is vernal keratoconjunctivitis also called as vernal catarrh also called as spring catarrh and this finding which you see is the famous shield ulcer it is a famous shield ulcer the shield ulcer that is seen in spring catarrh okay or vernal keratoconjunctivitis good if you identified it again another question of the spring catarrh and you see the giant flat papilla here these are the famous cobblestone papilla again the similar condition but different findings these are called you look at these flat stones they are the cobblestone papilla the cobblestone papilla of this is again seen in spring catarrh or vkc so this is a diagnostic finding the flat giant stones cobblestones of papilla remember cobblestone papilla papilla are all a sign of allergy and this is an allergy like no other these children literally scratch their eyes out very well then what about this another corneal finding and hopefully you'll identify look at these whitish dots looking like bread crumbs or like popcorns on the cornea this is the granular dystrophy this is the granular corneal dystrophy one of the three stromal dystrophies that we like to ask you of the cornea these are the granular corneal dystrophy which you see children these are inherited congenital opacification of the cornea bilateral non inflammatory progressing these are seen in children who are born with it. remember these are the granular dystrophy how do you recognize them by the typical popcorn shape here the good news is that they still have decent vision because there are clear intervals in between so this bread crumb like opacity is on the center of the cornea is a granular corneal dystrophy this is granular next thing another way fam look at these findings on this infiltration on the cornea can you see this whitish deposits slightly there's a lucid interval gap between the main ulcer and this is the what are these findings and most of you got this right these are the famous satellite lesions is not they are the most famous satellite lesions seen in fungal corneal ulcer remember only of all the ulcers of the cornea they are only found in fungal corneal ulcers okay these are the satellite lesions of fungal corneal ulcers and i have no doubt that all of you have got this what's next the next and now what procedure is being happening now look at this this is more tricky look at this typical 
yellowish, orangish, you know, greenish glow on the corner that you see. The question is what procedure is being performed and the answer is hopefully many have got it is C3R for keratoconus. You know, for keratoconus is a progressive thinning and ectasia of the cornea like this, this keratoconus. And this C3R stands for the three C's that we have. We have corneal, collagen, cross-linking with riboflavin. Is it not? For keratoconus, because thinning, progressive thinning, so these patients often get very frustrated. They say, look, doctor, you can see that the cornea is thinning. Why don't you do something for it? And now we can, we can stop the thinning by irradiating the cornea with ultraviolet light. You know, ultraviolet light falls in the cornea, and where we, while we pour riboflavin drops in the cornea, and this riboflavin drops acts as a photosensitizer. So it induces extra collagen bonds in the stroma. Extra collagen bonds in the stroma. It makes the cornea stiffer so that it does not increase the further thinning. We call this procedure, which you've all heard of, the corneal collagen cross-linking with riboflavin. That's why C3R, also nowadays called as CXL. Next findings, ladies and gentlemen. And again, look at these lovely things. Two rings inside the cornea. Can you see this? Two plastic rings, these are two plastic PMMA rings inserted into the corneal stroma and these are called, these findings are intacts, this is not, we call them intacts, intra corneal stromal rings, you know? corneal rings, these are two rings which are inserted in for keratoconus, again it is done for keratoconus, these are two PMMA plastic rings made of polymethyl methacrylate, you can see the crescentic shape. They've inserted there, we call them intacts, and they stand for intrastromal corneal rings. And these are done to flatten the cornea. Okay? So these are patients with temporizing measures because cone. So when we do that, we make the cornea flatter and the vision improves a little bit. Okay. So we it's a temporizing measure before we go for keratoplasty or before we go for other procedures. Suppose the patient is not able to see at all with glasses or contact lenses, we flatten the cone and it reduces the curvature of the cornea and makes them see, give them a little bit vision. But remember, it's just a temporizing measure. The best part of it is you can always take it out. If the patient is intolerable to the stromal rings, intracornal stromal rings, then you can always take them out through the same incision. But there are definite contraindications, you know, particularly the corneal thickness should be not less than 450 microns if you want to do an intax for catacorns. Now, what about this procedure? Now, this is a little more tricky. Now, you see this blue thing, the scrolled up thing, you know, and this blue scrolled up thing should give you the idea. Remember what is being done? This is a DMEC. This is the DMEC being one of the lamellar keratoplasts. Nowadays remember that we do not do so much of you know, full thickness keratoplasties because the chances of rejection are more. So we do lamellar keratoplasties. This is one of the endothelial keratoplasties that we do where we replace which stands for Desmet's membrane endothelial keratoplasty, DMEC. Desmet's membrane endothelial keratoplasty. And this is the one that we do for DMEC. Do you recognize this? Look at this thin scroll that is there where we have just inserted, we transplanted the Desmus membrane and the endothelium only. We have just taken it out from a donor, Desmus and endothelium only, and we've inserted from under the cornea like this. This is the fastest rehabilitation lamellar keratoplasty procedure possible. Patient will have very good vision, but technically demanding procedure, as you can see by the rolled up scroll here. This is the DMEC procedure and this is done for procedure for pathology of the posterior part of the cornea like endothelial problems like Fuchs dystrophy, enteral dystrophy, like posterior polymorphous dystrophy. These are DMEC. You know? So this is the fastest rehabilitation of any of the lamellar keratoplasties with minimal chance of rejection. Very well. That was a tough one that was, I can tell you. What about this procedure? Look at this carefully, ladies and gentlemen. This procedure, what is being happening here? And you can see by this partial thickness sclerectomy and the flap that you can see here, this is the trabeculectomy, okay. This is performed the trabeculectomy for glaucoma surgeries, okay. Remember for glaucoma, the third and the final procedure, particularly for open angle, is to make trabeculectomy where you make a small opening in the trabecular meshwork, remove this little piece so that there is directly, they from the acposumer, they can go under the subscleral space this is the flap that you can see. We are cutting of the trabecular meshwork, and this is the trabeculectomy. So, what surgery is being performed is trabeculectomy for glaucoma. Remember, trabeculectomy, not trabeculotomy for congenital glaucoma. It's ectomy. And you should be able to identify this by the 
rectangular flap that you can see and picking up the flap of rectangle and the small piece of triangular measure which is visible to us which will cut out and what about this procedure now the procedure that we see here is that you hopefully identify look at that this is the, again the capsular axis we began with a capsular axis and we are again almost ending with the capsular axis but this time you can see how ccc you no know, continuous curvilinear capsular axis how we are tearing it in a single fluid motion but unlike the first slide where we do trip and blue staining here you can see it you can see it because there is a red reflex coming from the red glow that you can see from immature cataract where we can see the capsule and cut it in a central curvilinear capsular axis opening like this. This is the capsular axis being performed. Okay? And the last slide is, man, is a simple one. We can identify this procedure that has been performed here. Can you all do that? And you can see that this is the, by the sutures, is a penetrating keratoplasty PK. You know? So the radial sutures perfectly aligned. The radial, the equidistant, symmetrical, equitension, so that there is no stigmatism the next day or very little stigmatism. This is the penetrating keratoplasty where you can see the central area has been donated by the donor and the peripheral area is the host who has taken on the graft. And it's a lovely graft. You can see clear glow and this is last for a lot of years because you know that con grafts do not reject because they are vascular. Okay? And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I have to say thank you for a very patient hearing for a long, long, even though I did say promise to short, I do think it's become a little long. Thank you very much and all the very best for your exams.